This episode of Distraction is sponsored by Landmark College in Putney, Vermont, where support begins in the application process and continues beyond graduation with resume help, interview preparation, and more through their Office of Career Connections. Learn more at lcdistraction.org. Landmark College. Learn your way. Succeed uniquely. Hi, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell for Distraction. Today's show picks up where we left off last time. Isn't that nice, picking up where we left off? Answering your questions about women and ADHD, or as Terry and I call it, ADD. I'm joined by Terry Matlin, psychotherapist, writer, consultant, and an ADHD coach specializing in ADHD in adults with a special focus on women. Thanks for joining me again, Terry. Well, thank you for having me back. I had a blast last week, and I'm so happy that you invited me back today. Thank you. We can't get enough of you. All right. Our wonderful producer, who is kind enough to stand in and ask questions to give a different voice, a female voice, to the questions. Sarah, would you like to start with our first question? Sure, absolutely. This comes from a listener named Delisa. I am in the process of being diagnosed at age 53 and was originally seeking help for depression, which I am now realizing was emotional flooding. Is there much research on women, migraines, and ADHD? My as-yet limited understanding is that there may be a connection between estrogen levels and norepinephrine, and that might be the connection. Is there research into whether migraines may constitute an ADHD subtype? Many thanks, Lisa. I don't have a very helpful uh, response to this, except that I have read that there is research that has been done that does show um, that men and women with ADHD do have a tendency for having migraine headaches. From what I recall, I believe that women were more apt to have the migraines than men. Uh, these are um, men and women with ADHD. Beyond that, there's really not much more I can add to that because uh, that's not an area of expertise for me other than this is what I've <laughs> this is what well, I've there, read. there's not much more to add I mean it's simply a, a fact that migraine is is more common in people with ADD there are a number of conditions that are associated statistically more frequently with ADD and migraine being one thyroid disorders is another uh, immune system problems history of early ear infections uh, is another bedwetting is another left-handedness or mixed dominance is another. Uh, Soft neurological signs like uh, problems with gait or problems with dropping things uh, is another. Being accident prone is another. All of these are uh, just statistically more common in people who have ADHD than the general population. That's really interesting. (laughs) Okay. Um, Hello, Dr. Hallowell. I have a lot of problems with self-confidence. I've had a few people come right out and say to me to work on my confidence. I probably already knew it, but I don't know how to get confidence. Is there a store I can buy it from? LOL. Thank you for your time, Stacey L. (laughs) Oh, well, this is Terry. Yeah, there's a website called confidence.com. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I wish there was because this is something we hear all the time, this lack of self-confidence. I mentioned last week a little bit about that, um, that growing up as a girl – being taught uh, subliminally even that girls need to know how to do all these different things to become a um, a proper woman who has a family and a, a partner, a husband, whatever, to be able to do all the things that women are supposed to do in this society. So I think we get the message very early on that this is what we should do. Well, if you have an ADHD brain, those things are not easy to do. Uh, planning Christmas, planning uh, birthday parties, cooking dinner every night, um, remembering to uh, sign your child up for activities in school. These are not things that come naturally to many of us women with ADHD. So what happens as these experiences build and build and build, well, what happens to your self-confidence? It just kind of blows apart for many women with ADHD, at least the majority of the ones that I work with, and I'm sure many that Dr. Hellwell works with, So what do you do? Well, we talked last week a little bit about working on the things that you are good at. So let's say you're really great at making friends 
Um, you're great at connecting people. You're great at running. You're a jogger. You love painting. You're a musician. Well, where are those things in, in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind? Let's, let's move them. Let's shift the way we see ourselves and focus on those positive traits and those, because everybody, everybody has things they do well. And a lot of us forget that because we overemphasize the negatives way too much. And so let's focus on the, on the positives and work on strengthening those positive things. And connecting, again, the vitamin C that uh, Ned talks about uh, a lot, which is so important for us to remember, and that's the connection. And we talked last week about finding other women who have ADHD, making friends with people who celebrate who you are regardless of whether you have ADHD or not. I find that most of my friends, I'll have to be careful because this is a, a podcast, but most of my friends have ADHD. I relate to them. I have fun with them. I can be myself. I can lose things, I can uh, forget things, I can call people by the wrong name and not be criticized. So it's, you know, finding the right connections for you will boost your self-confidence. And we have a real problem with toxic health people who think they're doing us a favor by pointing out our weaknesses. That's not helpful at all. So letting go of your relationships. Ter- I love that term, toxic help. Yeah, wow. it's toxic help. They, yeah. they think they're doing you a big favor by saying, well, geez, you know, if you would only uh, sweep up that little <laughs> pile of crumbs in the corner, your, your, your dog wouldn't uh, die of, uh, you know, getting poisoned by chocolate or whatever. Right, right. That's not helpful for us. What we need to hear are positive things. So yeah. take a look at who you hang out with. And uh, even with your own family members, if you have family members who are toxic, who hurt you, um, emotionally, um, those people, you don't, there's no rule that you have to continue seeing family members who are, who are poison for you. Yeah. And that's something that you can get a lot of help with if you go into therapy. And I would really highly advise you go into therapy with somebody who understands ADHD. Yes. Because yeah. many, unfortunately, many therapists don't get it and give, will give you the wrong kind of advice. So find a good therapist and work on that self confidence. Yeah, and people with ADD have a, a terrible tendency to spend a lifetime trying to get good at what they're bad at instead of doing what they're good at. And your advice is spot on, Terry. You know, try to – once you get to a certain age – I mean, in school, you have to get good at what you're bad at. But once you get to a certain age as an adult, you should focus on what you're good at and delegate the rest if you if, if you can, you know. And, and uh, as you said, try to give yourself credit – People with ADD have a terribly difficult time giving themselves credit. They're very eager to beat up on themselves, but sometimes they can seem almost impervious to positive feedback coming from others or from themselves. And uh, if you can embrace the good parts of your life, your, your confidence will improve. There's another way to grow confidence, which is to make progress at some activity that is both challenging and matters to you. So if it's cooking or swimming or negotiating a business deal, get a coach or somebody to help you make progress at some activity that is both challenging and matters to you. If you do that, guaranteed your confidence will increase. Our next question... Although I have always been a procrastinator and organization has never been my forte, I only began struggling with symptoms consistent with clinical ADD after being diagnosed with a recurrence of breast cancer and experiencing sudden-onset chemotherapy-induced menopause at age 42. I am now 51 and was just recently diagnosed with ADD that, in retrospect, has significantly impacted my ability to function in daily life and make a living over the last several years. I am wondering how common it is for women to experience the onset of difficulties with executive functioning after age 40 and what role chemotherapy and menopause may play in that. Thank you. Sandy from Alberta. Well, Sandy, I hope you're doing better. I hope you're you're getting your health back. That's a heart-wrenching question to read and uh, my my heart goes out to you but to answer your question um, I know that there is a thing called chemo brain that Ned I'm sure can address that much better than I can but we talked last week about how changes in hormones uh, in women can make uh, your ADHD worse as we get older especially so if you're uh, 40 and up you're probably hitting perimenopause and entering menopause 
And the drop in estrogen during that time will definitely uh, affect many, many women. Not all. I mean, I hear some women who say, no, I'm breezing through menopause, and those are the lucky ones. But for the most part, there will be uh, some significant changes in ADHD symptoms. For instance, um, having a hard time remembering words. I'm going through that right now. It's just uh, a tough time trying to come up with what is the word I'm trying to think of, and it makes me crazy. <laughs> um, so the whole executive function, which we haven't talked much about uh, last week, uh, comes into play. Uh, you look at something in your hand and you think, gee, what was I going to do with this? What? <laughs> or if you're cleaning your house and you end up in the kitchen when you should have been in the living room because you looked at something and thought, gee, I need to first go into the other room and see what's going on there. Before you know it, you're in about you know four different rooms before you get anything put away. So these things do affect women as we age, and uh, there are ways to manage that. I can't remember now because of my own <laughs> ADHD and uh, hormonal changes whether we talked about what types of medication can be helpful during those times. Now, with chemotherapy, this would be a very individualized plan for you, Sandy. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, in general, for older women, uh, Dr. Patricia Quinn, who uh, has studied hormonal changes in the treatment for women with ADHD, has talked uh, a lot about, uh, gosh, hormonal medications, hormone replacement is, can be helpful, um, adding antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications during changes in women's lives. Those are all things that can be uh, looked at. But again, and we keep repeating this, Ned and I, about the, how helpful it is to work with an ADD coach because we really need uh, another brain helping us, but also learning very pragmatic skills on how to get things done. And being held accountable is a huge factor in getting things done. So in my group, uh, I have a group called the Queens of Distraction where we meet online um, every Sunday I make a list, okay, what are the three things you're going to work on this week? And it might be just as simple as getting the laundry done because even though it sounds simple for women, for women with ADHD, it's not simple at all because it requires a lot of steps that we don't really think about. We just say to ourselves, I have a hard time with laundry. Well, why is that? It's because there are different segments. You have to remember to do it, number one. You have to think about sorting things, the lights and darks. That's not always easy. And when you put something in the washing machine, for example, we'll, at, we'll be apt to forget to take it out and put it into the dryer. So what happens the next day you have smelly laundry, then you have to start all over again. So these are things that uh, women without ADHD often don't struggle with, but we, I know firsthand that that's a problem. And there are solutions to how to manage these day-to-day -day activities that women often, you know, have to manage. So we need a little bit of help as we get older with medications, with you know, getting more exercise, getting uh, or another major thing we haven't talked about is enough sleep. The sleep disorders are very commonly seen in women with ADHD, especially as we get older, because we see it also in just women without ADHD who are going through menopause. So a lot of things to look at, to um, think about, and to talk to your doctor about. All right, here's our last question, and I had to paraphrase. This email was a little bit long, so I paraphrased it a little bit. But Andrea wrote, I am a 42-year-old single parent of two kids ages 16 and 6. I discovered that I have ADHD when I was in the process of getting my son diagnosed a little over a year ago. It has been mind-blowing. Looking back, I have always had it. I would repeat classes multiple times at least once going back as far as driver's ed when I was 15. I always felt that the world went faster than me. I would have a huge delay in understanding new information or complex situations. I would often wake up in the middle of the night with work on my mind and solutions that I needed to process right away for fear that I would forget them in the morning. The processing delay was super embarrassing, but I don't know if that is part of the ADHD. Is it? Andrea also goes on to write, I'm super sensitive to smell and can often smell things no one else can. Is that part of ADHD? And finally, she's also worried about pushing her ADHD symptoms onto her kids. And she asks, does that happen? Well, those are great questions and where to start. First of all, being a mom with ADD and having kids, whether they have ADD or not, is an area that I'm very interested in because, well, it's my life. I have ADD, and one kid, uh, one of my kids, had, well, she's now a young adult, 
has ADHD, and it was a very, very challenging time of my life to try and teach my kids how to be organized when I couldn't figure out how to organize myself. So it's it's very commonly seen that this is a time of a lot of stress for, for and, and you being a, a single mom at 42 with two kids is very, very difficult. So yeah, the things that you're describing of having to repeat classes multiple times, very commonly seen in ADHD. What we didn't really talk much about is that we often see learning uh, disabilities along with ADHD. That could be part of your picture. I'm not sure because it can be seen without uh, learning disabilities. So one thing you could do is get a neuropsych testing done to see exactly what is going on with your brain. Is it just ADHD or are there other things going on that are more in the realm of learning disabilities or processing problems? So I would get that checked out. You say you uh, often wake up in the middle of the night with things on your mind. Uh, Ned talks a lot about, he has a book out called Worry. I think that's the right title, but yep. he talks about the people with or without ADHD. But with ADHD, we see a lot of this obsessing and ruminating, worrying, overthinking things, and that can keep us up at night, definitely. So yes, all the things that you're describing are very often seen, uh, often seen in ADHD. But you wrote something that really touches my heart because I have a super interest in something that is rarely talked about, and that has to do with hypersensitivities and ADHD. In fact, I've written a bit about it um, and have presented on it at the conferences that I uh, go to, like a chat at ADA. Hypersensitivity and ADHD, we see a lot of men and women, but I see it more in women where they're they can smell things <laughs> other people can't smell. I'll tell you a little vignette story. If you're interested, I'll go fast. But way back uh, before I was diagnosed with ADHD, I remember waking up in the middle of the night because I smelled skunk on our dog, <laughs> and our dog um, slept with my husband and I. But it woke me up at something like 2 in the morning, and I couldn't mm. understand how could my dog be sprayed at 2 in the morning by a skunk when we were all asleep. So I woke up my husband, and I said, something, something's going on in the house. There's a skunk here. We've, we've got to check this out. So we walked around the house. He didn't know what I was talking about. He thought I was nuts. But the odor of the skunk on the dog was just so overwhelming. Anyhow, we never found a skunk, and we went back to sleep. But he called me uh, when he got to work that next morning, um, and he said, you know what? A mile away from the house, there was a dead skunk on the road. So even it was even though it was a mile away, it was strong enough for my uh, super smell, uh, whatever you call it, sensation. Wow! It woke me up. Wow! So I am very much um, part of this hypersensitivity group with ADHD, in that I see things, I smell things, I hear things that other people just miss. So as I got more interested in this, I began asking other women with ADHD and. Not surprisingly, many of them have the same problem. They see, they smell, things irritate them, certain textures. Uh, I can't wear wool. Many women and men with ADHD cannot wear wool. Mm -hmm. uh, we go for cotton. A lot of women will say, well, as soon as they walk in the door from work, they take off their bra, they take off their shoes, they just mm -hmm. can't stand the sensation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are not alone, Andrea. This is a very common part of having ADHD, these hypersensitivities, which... If you go even further, and Dr. William Dodson talks about it, so does Ned, about um, being hypersensitive just to feelings, that our feelings get hurt very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the neurobiological component to that, but I sure do see it. So what rolls off of other people's shoulders, we take to heart and often are up much of the night just ruminating about those things. Yep. And then lastly, you asked about... Uh, Will her ADD symptoms be passed on to her kids? Well, we know it's highly genetic. And so, yeah, there's a great, very strong uh, chance that one or more of your, one or both of your kids could have ADHD. So that would be something to look out for. I always tell my adults with ADD to keep an eye on your kids. So, yeah, that's something to um, take a look at. I wouldn't be overly worried and obsessed about it if they're doing okay. Um, you know, relax. We need to learn to relax, Ned, don't we? Absolutely, absolutely. And and if one of your kids has it, you know, if someone tells me they have ADD, I say, great. You know, because once you know you have it, then everything starts to get better because you can do something about it. The bad things happen when you don't know you have it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it, you know, I think I think this woman was also worried about is is ADD contagious, and the, and the answer to that is no. I mean, you 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 may not be able to teach your kids the habits they need to develop because you don't have them yourself, but that's where you want to get a coach or a therapist or a spouse or somebody else to pass on to them what you're not able to pass on. Uh, but remember, managed properly, this condition becomes an asset. So don't be afraid of it. You know, the thing to be afraid of is ignorance. Uh, and, and, and certainly there are many resources now where, where you, you, you can get the help you need. Ned, you said in the past, and I've always uh, enjoyed this quote of yours, and I can't remember it word for word, but you said, in a sense, you know, you're lucky if you're diagnosed with ADHD because it's the most highly treatable yes. of conditions. Uh, unlike, say, depression and anxiety or bipolar and those types of things, yes. that uh, you can have a tremendously positive response to the proper treatment. Exactly. This is of all the conditions in the in the behavioral sciences. This is the most treatable to the point where you can turn it into an asset. You can really minimize the damage done by the downside and maximize the good that comes from the upside. Absolutely. I totally agree. Mm-hmm. My my own ADHD, because uh, I'm distracted and I get bored easily, and we didn't really talk about getting bored mm-hmm. easily, mm-hmm. has uh, been a huge, huge asset for me because since I can't tolerate boredom, yeah. I've become a musician and an artist uh, throughout my life. So I am never bored. I can't, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of people I talk to, they, they're in the creative arts or yeah. they're entrepreneurs. Yeah. Their brains are working in, in wonderful ways. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they can't sit and be bored. Yeah, yeah. That's why I write so many books. I just finished my 20th book. I mean, it's a, uh, we all, we, we need to have a creative outlet. That's another thing. I mean, we, I think it's a part of treatment, if you will, that doesn't get talked about enough. We, we really need to have creative outlets. We mm-hmm. do much better when we have creative outlets. Well, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Have we come to the end of our questions? Yes, uh, that okay. is it for questions, but we would always, encourage more questions from listeners if this sparked any other questions. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thanks a million, Terry. It was wonderful having you. Ned, thank you so much for inviting me. I always enjoy working with you, and I hope to come back again. Please, listeners, send in questions because we will invite Terry back. We will get to them. If you'd like to learn more about Terry Metlin and her work, just click on the link in the episode description or go directly to her website, addconsults.com. That's addconsults.com. You can join one of her groups, you can get her books, and you can access this remarkable woman's tremendous wealth of experience. And please, if you have a question or show idea for us, send it to connect at distractionpodcast.com. That's connect at distractionpodcast.com. Or call us at 844-55-CONNECT. That's 844-55-CONNECT. And leave a message. And if you haven't done so already, take a moment to leave us a review. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. It helps us a lot. Hey guys, it's Sarah here, producer on Distraction. Just a heads up that we have a new sister podcast out, the Royal Wedding Podcast with Rob Shooter, bringing you news, updates, and interviews every week leading up to the noble nuptials. So go to royalweddingpodcast.com and subscribe. Distraction is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcast for curious people. Our producer is the wonderful Sarah Gurton. Our audio engineer is the brilliant Scott Person. Our original music theme was created by the invisible and never hear Mark Berman. <laughs>